Dear Oksana Zabusko, I am very pleased to welcome you at this year's celebration of International Women's Day. And on this day, the word celebration is not, I think, a word we could use because the shelling on Ukraine continues unabated. We have all seen, heard, and felt some of the misery of the victims of the aggression, the first of which are always women and girls. And yet, in these dark days, we, we witness strength and we witness courage. In Ukraine, women are resisting. They are standing up, pushing back, and taking up arms against their aggressor. So it is therefore even more important and a privilege to have with us today a Ukrainian woman and writer, Oksana Sabusko, whose literature and strong voice exhibits the very strength of Ukrainian women in the face of oppression. Oksana, you left Ukraine two weeks ago with nothing but your hand luggage, and you have not had the possibility to return since. In Russia and in Belarus, women are protesting on the streets in an act of defiance against their governments. And they do this in spite of the serious repercussions that they face. To these women, we say, Europe stands united with you. We stand united with you. Because there are no winners in war. There is only death. Only the pain that someone bears when they are forced to leave their country, when they learn that their loved ones are not coming home, when they have to bury their children. Colleagues, the brave and resilient women of Ukraine serve as an inspiration to us all. Because yes, there is extraordinary power behind a Ukrainian woman asking a fully armed Russian soldier to put sunflower seeds in his pocket so that if he dies on her homeland, flowers may bloom from his lifeless body. These are the acts of heroines defending the same European values that we hold. And on International Women's Day, this European Parliament will serve as a platform for the strength of these brave women to be shown to the world. Thank you, and Oksana, you have the floor. Dear Mrs. President, dear members, dear friends, I cannot be more appreciative for this invitation and for this unique opportunity to speak here on Women's Rights Day at probably the darkest hour in Europe since 1939. For most of my literary career, I've been speaking for women and in the name of women. In my writings, I've been aimed to give voice to the experiences of women subjected to violence, to those living and dead whose feelings, ideas, or accomplishments were ignored, devalued, or simply forgotten. I've spoken for women's rights to be free from discrimination and gender inequality for their right to live in accordance with their own wishes and preferences. This, however, is the first time that I have to stand up for a woman's right to life itself. Ukrainians are a strong nation. This appears to have surprised many in the West, yet were it not so, we would not have survived Stalin's genocide, the horrific man-made famine of 1933, notably still unrecognized by most of the countries represented here. 
And we are a nation of strong women too. Along with the rest of the world, I cannot but admire with tears in my eyes my fellow countrywomen now fighting right alongside our men. They've joined the army and the civil territorial defense forces. They manage the distribution of supplies across our besieged cities, some of which, like Mariupol, stand on the verge of a humanitarian catastrophe now. They give birth in bomb shelters, supported and supervised by doctors online. Ukrainian doctors, meanwhile, have created Facebook pages offering instructions on how women over 37 weeks pregnant might safely deliver children in bomb shelters. An image that strikes me as almost biblical as sounds of Mary's hide with their newborns evading King Herod in basements, subway stations, and other stables. Yes, we are strong and grateful for your support and your admiration. The problem is Putin's bombs will not be stopped by the strength of our spirit. And babies born in bomb shelters die of sepsis caused with the dust raining down on, on them during attacks. Mary's stable was much more hygienic. Since February 24th, when Russia launched its invasion, conceived as a blitzkrieg, only to be foiled by the ferocious determination of our military and mobilized civilians, one of history's unshakable rules has been reconfirmed. In any hot war, women make the most vulnerable targets, if only because it's women who remain to take care of those in need, of children and the elderly. And it is precisely this living shield which Vladimir Putin now uses to break Ukraine's heroic resistance. Having failed to take Kyiv, Putin began shelling residential areas, including elementary schools, nurseries, and hospitals. Let me take the liberty of stressing this. Every moment of hesitation on the side of Western policymakers and NATO decision makers about whether to provide Ukraine with anti-aircraft weapons, not to speak of the no-fly zone. Every coffee break you are taking during your discussions about how to interfere without provoking Putin to go further costs someone's life, most likely a civilian's, a woman's or a child's. After all, Putin said it quite openly back on April 17, 2014, in the first act of the current tragedy, which he called a special military operation, Russian Spring, and which then resulted in the annexation of Crimea and in creating two Russian-controlled military zones in Donbass, but was initially meant to accomplish much more. That day, eight years ago, he openly announced that Russian troops in Donbass would be standing against Ukrainian army behind Ukrainian women and children. I quote literally, not in front of them, but behind, behind daring Ukrainian army to shoot. A living shield, a typical terrorist tactic. He was then so confident of his superiority, so sure that no one would dare stop him, 
that he did not even bother to lie out of contempt to his audience. Isn't it amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that no one outside of Ukraine, maybe, took then his words seriously? In May 2014, after Russian soldiers in Donbass had already begun slicing open people's bellies and shooting at teenagers for carrying yellow and blue flags, I was speaking in Berlin at the European Writers' Forum. And when in my speech I compared Putin to Hitler and Stalin, the moderator was so shocked that my microphone was turned off and in the publication the comparison was censored. Eight years passed. So many human lives could have been saved if only the EU and the US would have woken up eight years ago to the fact that the new Hitler was ready to pick up where the previous one had left off. <laughs> if the current package of sanctions had been applied to Russia back then, right after the annexation of Crimea, and evil called by its proper name and resisted, instead of being ignored and appeased, we would not be where we are now. I know my ifs sound similar to the litanies that writers and intellectuals who survived World War II were proposing after the war ended. Yet for me, it is also a sign that we, and by we, I mean all Western civilization to which Ukraine with its millennium long history also belongs, that we have not learned much from history. Putin deliberately imitates Hitler. He even uses Hitler's very language, ref referring to the final solution of the Ukrainian question and barely disguising quotations from Hitler's speech at Reichstag on September 1st, 1939. I will not war against women and children. I have ordered my air force to restrict itself to attacks on military objectives. That's from 1939, not from 2022. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is the announcement of war. Vladimir Putin has done it in his tricky, perverted KGB language. But I am here to tell you, as a writer who does know something about language and how easily its power can be misused, that it is already a world war, not a conflict in Ukraine as it is still described in many Western media. And that you better trust Mr. Putin when he pronounces his ambitions. He has already claimed back the former Soviet bloc, which is what he really means by demanding that NATO pull back from Eastern Europe. And he won't stop unless he is stopped by an international front of all those nations who still believe that freedom and human solidarity are worth more than gas and oil. Ladies and gentlemen, you have all seen videos of how Ukrainian civilians, men and women, stop Russian tanks with bare hands and loud curses. Here lies the secret of our heroism. We are not afraid of Russia. Of all the nations in Europe, we know that what Putin has for decades been selling to the West as the true story his nuclear blackmailing included, is nothing but a pack of lies, illusion, and bluff. We know this because we do have our share in the past 300 years of Russian imperial greatness 
and by no means a minor one. That is why of all the nations it is Ukraine that has found herself at the forefront of this war. Without us, there can be no Russian empire. No evil empire, ladies and gentlemen, that used to be a good term after all. First, there was Austria, then Czechoslovakia, then Poland, then Europe. First, it was Georgia, then Belarus, then Ukraine, afterwards, Europe. While I was writing this, my niece and her two children, one eight years old, the other eight months old, were driving from Kiev to Western Ukraine at a speed 200 kilometers in 10 hours. Women of Ukraine are fleeing en masse from the Russian bombs flattening their homes, while Ukrainian men stay to fight as long as, as it's needed to free Europe from the specter of the new totalitarianism. They all know their job, both men and women. Please don't be afraid to protect the sky above them. Thank you. Thank you.